Okay, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first genealogy online class of the spring season. I'm going to put be putting a link to the handout into the chat for those of you who weren't able to download it ahead of time. Today's topic is researching your female ancestors. So before we get going, we have some business to take care of. First of all, <clears throat> excuse me, we acknowledge that the Boston Public Library's Central Library stands on land that was once a water-based ecosystem providing sustenance for the indigenous Massachusetts people. It is a place which has long served as a site of a meeting and exchange among nations. We are committed to land acknowledgements for all locations at which we operate. We reaffirm this commitment to set the context for our planning. Deliberations and public engagement will take place from the spirit of welcome and respect found in our motto, free to all. So uh, I know some folks are curious, this class is being recorded and I will be sending a link to the recording to everyone who has registered once it is available, which will hopefully be within the next few days. I will also be sending a follow-up email tomorrow that will have a link to my class slides as well as the handout in the chat transcript. So you don't have to worry about if you missed anything, you will be getting links to everything. The chat box is open. So if you want to talk amongst yourselves or if you have any questions, go right ahead. I will be able to take questions at the end of my presentation. And if you have any trouble hearing me or anything like that, please let me know in the chat. All right, so for those of you who are new here, my name is Jesse Wheeler. I am the genealogy specialist here at the BPL. I work in the research services department at the Central Library in Copley Square. What we're covering today are researching your female ancestors. So this is just a brief over, overlook at what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna go over mostly some research tips as to how to do this kind of research. Look at some useful records, some that you may not have thought about or even realized could be useful. We're gonna take a quick look at some archives that might be helpful, look at some websites, and then we're gonna talk about uh, some resources we have here at the BPL. And the images you're gonna see throughout my slideshow are taken from Digital Commonwealth, uh, which is a free website the BPL contributes to. So, um, most of these are gonna be from uh, prints, I believe, from our newspaper advertising collection. All right, you can see here we have the Ladies Home Journal. I just thought this was a wonderful picture. All right, so research tips. So first, you know, I do want to go over, you know, why it can be hard to research women. For instance, uh, women didn't have the right to vote until 1921. So a lot, any records that are derived from voter registration rolls, like a list of residents, women will not be in. Women are not going to be in the city directories. Uh, at all, unless they're a head of household, which usually meant they were widowed. Eventually they would be in there next to their husband's name. And it wasn't until uh, the early, you know, the first, I think the thirties or forties that women would be listed under their own rights. So it's a little tough to find records of women in the usual resources, especially if we're talking about prior to mid century, you know, 1940s, 1950s, they're really hard to find. So. So these are some things you can do to try to get ahead on women you're researching. So if the, someone, if the person you're researching uh, was alive relatively recently, what you can do is talk to people who knew her. So if there are any relatives, like a sibling, a cousin, child, grandchild, anything like that, a friend, a neighbor, someone they worked with, anyone who may have known her, uh, if they're able to talk to you, definitely ask them uh, what they knew about her. Along those lines, if you have a relative or like, for instance, sometimes there's a cousin that has somehow inherited all the family history records. If someone you're related to or you know has a collection of records like Bibles or photos or scrapbooks or anything else, you can ask them if they can share that information with you. So this can also be true if you find someone on one of those DNS, DNA testing sites like Ancestry.com, you can message someone and ask if they might be willing to help you out or if they, if you know of any information. When you do find a record, and this is true for research in general, not just looking for women, 
You want to pay attention to the details in a record aside from a name, especially if you're researching a woman. If the other information is correct aside from the name, for instance, if the birth date, place, spouse's name, anything else is the same as what you already know and what is in another record, it might be probably the same person, even if the rec even if the name is wrong. Names could be spelled wrong. They might have gone by a different name. For instance, I have a great aunt who I only ever knew as Claire, but eventually, apparently she was actually Mary Claire. Would not have been able to find her in the census if I hadn't been told that eventually she was in the census under Mary, not Claire. So those are some things you might need to keep in mind that the name might be a little different, particularly for all the Marys of a certain generation. Especially for Catholic, there were lots of Marys that didn't go by Mary. So that's another thing to keep in mind. So related to that, check every single possible variation of a woman's name. So women could be listed depending on the time period. They could be listed under their maiden name, their married name. They could have a nickname, for instance, my great aunt by Claire, but her first name was Mary. They could have gone by their initials. They could have gone by their husband's name. It was really common. Uh, especially in things like newspaper articles to for a woman to be referred to as Mrs. Husband's name. It's so like she would be under the, in there under Mrs. John Smith. So that's another thing you need to keep in mind. For instance, my grandmother, in her obituary, her so entry isn't wasn't Jeanette Herman. It was Mrs. William F. Herman. That's how she was listed. And that was in the late 60s when she passed. So that's another thing to keep in mind. And then you, if you know she was married, even if she, the record you're looking for is from the time period where she was married, search for both her married and her maiden names. You never know. There might be some things where she's still listed under her maiden name. Other issue is if she was married multiple times, try looking for all of her married names. I had a research question once where I was looking for a whole family of sisters, all of whom were married at least three times. One of them also sometimes randomly went by their confirmation name or their middle name. So they were really hard to track down because there were lots of names I had to keep track of trying to find all these folks. That's one thing to keep in mind. So if you're still having trouble uh, searching for her under her own name, you can try searching for particularly the men in her life. So. Her husband is the big one. If she was married, try looking for her husband. As I said, women won't be listed in city directories, but if you know she was married during a particular year, you can search for her husband's name and see where he's at because chances are she's probably with him if she was still married. If she wasn't married or if she was separated from her husband or it was in a different situation like that, they could she could have lived with a different relative. So you can look for siblings aunts or uncles, adult children. It was pretty common, especially for widowed women to move in with uh, an adult married child. That happened quite a bit. So you can try looking for uh, their child or if their child that they lived with was a daughter, you could try looking for their son-in-law. Really any other relative you think they might live, might have lived with, you can try looking for. And outside of relatives, you can search for, look for any known male associates. So this could be someone they worked with, someone she lived near, godparent, godchildren, any, any male that you know she had an association with, depending on the record, you might be able to find them that way. The other key thing here is to look at a lot of different types of records, particularly if you're having a hard time, you know, with standard records like censuses, city directories, lists of residents, and various other things. You might need to kind of think outside the box as to what records you can look for her in. So along those lines, we're going to talk about some records that might be useful that you may not have thought of. So this, is, this first one is especially helpful if you're researching someone from a longer time ago, local histories. So the BPL has a collection of local histories from most cities and towns in Massachusetts, and fairly certain these were published for pretty much all over the country. Histories like this, well, they will generally start from the founding of the place up right up and cover right up until the book was published. So these can be really helpful particularly if you're researching someone who was a part of a family who were the founders or the original settlers of a place. So and things like that, you can find out uh, information about their family, who their parents were, might say where they were born, particularly if they, you know, if they were original settler who came from England, they might tell you where they were from. 
if you get a town local history that does genealogies, there are some like that. They'll do little quick genealogies of their founders or prominent citizens. You might have a descendant listed there, so then you can try tracing them that way. So like I said, the BPL has lots and lots of these, mostly for Massachusetts, but uh, if you're not, if you're visit, if you're joining us from outside of Massachusetts, this is something that can be useful no matter where you are, you know, find your local history. Historical societies might have these things and a lot of places will have a town historian that might have resources that can help you out with that. So the other thing, so city directories, things like that can be helpful still. So city directories, at some point, the women would be listed in parentheses after their husband's name. So again, looking for the husband, you might still be able to find her. And eventually women will be listed under their own names. List of residents, women will start to be listed after 1921. Once we got the right to vote, they will be listed in those. Uh, why list of residents are particularly helpful is they will tell you where the person lived the year before, so you can kind of trace them backwards that way. There are also things um, if they were had a if they had a trade, if they had a profession. Excuse me. They might be listed there. So, for instance, if they were a doctor. If they owned a store in the garment industry, if they might be listed in directories or almanacs related to whatever industry they're a part of. It would also, excuse me, just, sorry, the air is very dry in here. I do apologize. Society's directories can also be pretty useful. Things like the Social Register or Clark's Blue Book, they did list women. Again, depending on the time period, you might have to look for a husband's name uh, to find them, but that is one of the rare directories that will list young unmarried women in them. So they will be listed in the grouping with their father, so you still would kind of need to look for their father, but that's one of the rare directories that will have unmarried women in them. So why these things can be useful, obviously they'll tell you about their occupation, that you might uh, get a sense of how, if they were well regarded in their fields, if they belong to any social clubs. This is particularly true for society directories. And they might tell you where they were born and various random things. So directories can still be useful, even if you're researching a, a time period where women generally aren't going to be listed in the big ones. There's lots of other ways you can go about it. So this is one of the more obscure collections. So things like institutional records, so hospital records, uh, what called insane asylum records, or uh, back in um, you know the late 19th, early 20th centuries, they would have been called state hospitals. I have a great aunt that spent most of her adult life at the Framingham State Hospital. That's where she lived. I don't know what her issue was, but I know that's where she was. So if I were to ever be motivated enough to try to find those records, I might be able to find out more about her. Another thing is our settlement house records. Those settlement houses were organizations that were usually, were often run by women. Uh, they would offer classes, uh, educational classes uh, for a lot of widow women, single women, to try to get them a better education so they could get a better job. They, off and they offered all sorts of assistance to the poorer classes in the area. Another thing that were big, uh, there once uh, people realized what caused tuberculosis, they would have been housed in sanitariums. So those kinds of records can tell you things about their family. So that can tell you also if first if a woman was married, what their maiden name was, siblings, basically any next of kin, their children, where they were from. And depending on how thorough it is, you might get a whole medical history and uh, more about their education and even what they looked like. So if you're researching someone you don't have a picture of, they might get a physical description of them in some records like this. One of the best resources though for finding information, even about, about anyone, not just women, would be Newspapers, there's all sorts of cool things that you can find outside of obituaries. Most people who do family history research know you can look for obituaries in newspapers, but there is a lot more you can go with. One of the more amusing things are husbands posting notices saying, I am no longer covering my wife's debts. So don't bug me if she owes you money, I'm not responsible for her. 
can kind of get a sense of what was kind of going on in her home life. And there's also in more rural areas, especially, there'll be unclaimed mail notices. So that'll tell you such and such has a letter close to such and such a date. So then you can kind of get an idea of where they lived. And also there were things called women's sections. Sometimes they'd be called the style section or the society page. Society pages are a gold mine. They will list things like such and such visited such and such, or someone was taking a ship going somewhere, or I just found this recently. Uh, someone threw my great grandmother a surprise party in 1917 and talked about they there was music and dancing and a tasty dinner was served. So that was my great grandmother. She wasn't a high society person. She was just a regular woman from a blue collar family, but there was still a little blurb about a surprise party for her in the newspaper. So even if the person you're researching wasn't the sort of person who'd be in the social register, there still might be some information about her in the society section about what she was up to, who she was going to see, what was she sick, anything like that. There, I, I, I teach entire classes about this, so I really think newspapers are very, very useful. So from those, you can figure out if you didn't know uh, their maiden name, you can find that out that way. You can find out things about her family, her friends, uh, whether or not she was married, and where she lived. So and since the notice about my grandmother said what street she lived on, because it was a small town, so everyone pretty much knew everyone. So they like, oh yeah, that's Lena on Mohegan Street. So which I just thought that was really, really cool. Another set of records that, again, are kind of a little obscure would be women's groups. So one of the big ones that probably most of you have heard of would be the temp would be the Women's Christian Temperance Union, which is actually still around. So things like this, often they, if they still exist, like the Temperance Union, they'll have their own archives. So you can check with them. If you know that someone you're researching was a member, you might be able to find information about when she registered, dues paid, whether or not she held an office, how long she was there, did she go to any big meetings or anything like that. Some of them are just going to be auxiliary things related to men's groups, like, for instance, the Daughters of Rebecca, basically the women's auxiliary to the Order of Odd Fellows, which is a fraternal organization. The site of Rebecca's are, was for the women, and they are also still around. <laughs> and so there's a bunch of different women's groups uh, that, you know, might have, or even if they're not still around, that a lot of them will have donated their archives to someplace local. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. So if you do find records like this, you might be able to find out ranks or offices, basically how it functions. So this will help you, you know, get a little idea of what your ancestor was involved in, what their beliefs may have been, what they were doing with whatever free time they had. Okay, so now we're going to go over where you might be able to find some of this information uh, in archives and websites. So for archives, this is one of the more troubling things. There were Eugenics is basically kind of a thing where people thought certain people should be able to reproduce and certain other people shouldn't. So it was a national policy. This was something that people thought was okay for a disturbing amount of time. So there are records to this. So this is something where, uh, so the American Philosophical Society Library has eugenics record off uh, record office records which co covers up through 1964 so this goes from when the office was founded in 1910 to 1964 when it finally was closed so these things will tend to have information these will have medical history and physical descriptions if or if you have an ancestor who is somehow involved with this if they were basically a victim of this sort of program you be able to find a lot of information about them there. And there's also related to that, there's an image library. So these things you can kind of click and browse around and look at some of their virtual exhibits. And I've included this mostly if you want, you know, if you wanted to learn more about it and like the different laws and things that kind of contributed to the popularity of this movement, which is again, 
very unfortunate. Okay, so going back to uh, the Daughters of Rebecca, which is the Women's uh, Association related to the Independent Order of Odd Fellows, they actually have a section on their website for genealogy research. So <clears throat> it will give you a lot of information about what they have, how you can get to it, who to contact, what you need to include in your request. And, you know, I don't think they, they don't guarantee that they'll be able to find it, but they can you know, definitely willing to help you out with that. So this is something to keep in mind if you have a relative or an ancestor who was part of this group. And this also follows if you were, uh, if you have a relative who is in the Odd Fellows as opposed to the Rebecca's. Another great one. So this is an example of an archive that's held by a different organization. So the Young Women's Christian Association of the USA, which is a female uh, association related to the YMCA, which I'm sure most of you will be familiar with, their archives are held by Smith College. So that's again, uh, so this is the finding aid. So this will tell you what they have, what kind of things they have, uh, go into their record group. So you can get, you can see here, they have records of their programs, student work, and they even have some photographs. So if you have someone who was in this group, there might be a picture of them in there. And so another one, uh, so there's the record, the other option is sometimes records like this will be microfilmed and they're available at different organize at different places. So this is one example of that. The records of the National Association of, uh, sorry about that, it's being a little annoying right now, the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs. That covers 1895 to 1992. This is a microfilm record set. We do not have this here at the BPL, but there are other libraries in the area that have it. Let's click on that. So I will say yeah, Harvard does have it, but those of you who are familiar with researching at Harvard will know that Harvard can be a little weird about letting people use them, but there are enough other places that have it that you should be able to get some help in using this set if that's something you wanna look at. So that this is just one example of record sets that were microfilmed and, and uh, the set purchased by different places. So those are some of just some of the archives we can look at. So there's been a lot written on this subject because it's if you've been doing this for kind of research for any length of time, you know it is very, very hard to research women. So I'm just going to show you just a few different uh, guides and articles. So one is a there's a professional genealogist uh, named Amy Johnson Crow. So she writes really short, easily digestible things. I'll just quickly go over things. And this is also a 12 minute podcast. So you can listen to it as well. It's kind of going over some of the things we've been talking about, you know, look at everything you can find, look for their husband and also any family members. So if you want to just, if you want to listen to someone else talk about this, that's one of your options. Another really great resource is familysearch.org. So some of you might be familiar with this. This is a free research site and they have a, basically a Wikipedia, but for family research. And they also have a blog that will again, just go over uh, things you can do. I mean, some of this is gonna be kind of repetitive, but there might be, they might let you have different ideas. And the good thing about this one is they will, it will link to some of the records they have online. So their blog posts are integrated with their digitized records. You do need to register for a free account in order to use their materials, but again, it is completely free. And they also will sometimes link to different resources that are available out there other than them. So this is a really cool resource. Uh, this is from the Walker Library at the Middle State Tennessee University. They have a database called Discovering, whoops. There we go, Discovering American Women's History. So we're just gonna, so basically they have uh, lots and lots of collections here. We're gonna take a just quick browse here so we can just get a look. So there's, they have lots of images in here. So they have scrapbooks, photographs, trade cards, uh, history books, manuscripts, letters, they have all sorts of really cool things in there. I highly recommend just kind of browsing through there. This is all, this can also be good to get a sense of the history 
uh, related to you know women's history. I always recommend folks research the history of a place or a time period for the ancestor they're researching, so you can get a better sense of what was going on in their life and what was what they're going on in their family, the kinds of issues they were facing. So that can give you not only a better sense of who they were as people, but also it can give you a good idea of what kind of information you can find about them, what might be available and kind of where you could go. Oh, this is Okay, so this is relatively new. Academy Awards Acceptance Speech Database. Like I said, they have a lot of really cool stuff in here. So I always, I, rec I definitely recommend just kind of browsing through here to, you know, just to see the kind of cool things that are there. So another really useful website is something called Cindy's List. So this, for those of you who remember uh, Yahoo, uh, you know, old school Yahoo that had links to different categories of things, it's very similar to that. Cindy is just one person. So if you see a broken link in there, just you can let her know she will fix it again eventually because again, she has little buttons here. So you can, if you happen to have an update for a link, she will fix it again. She's just one person. She is wonderful. So there's different categories here. She has lots and lots of categories for any type of genealogy, family history topic you can think of, including women. So this will go over different things you can look at. So let's say for instance, you want to look at societies in groups. This will tell you, you know, information about temperance groups, various, the anti-saloon league, and various even societies that are still currently active. So this is a, again, this is a great resource. I recommend it in all my classes for all types of genealogy topics. So we have another uh, post here from Amy Johnson Crow. I really I do like her. She doesn't update her blog that much, but she puts so much effort into what she does. Everything she does is pretty good. So these are just more things again, and it's a short little podcast. It's only 12 minutes long. So they have different. So this one actually is just a podcast you'd have to listen to. So this will go over even more weird, you know, different records that you might not have thought of to research your female ancestors. So this is another issue. So we're going to talk about this a little bit. So one issue that might, especially that might affect you, especially if you're researching uh, an immigrant ancestor, is the issue of naturalization. The laws related to naturalization change many times over the course of the history of the United States, and it was kind of complicated. Whether or not a woman was naturalized and whether or not there might be a record will depend on when it happened. And whether or not she was married and if she was married to a citizen of the US or, a, or another immigrant. So there's a lot of different variations you can get on that. It is pretty complicated. I actually had a guest speaker on this topic last year, uh, which because this is such a thorny issue and the laws are very wide ranging, this is a little old, but it's still a lot of useful information. So this kind of just distills it down into this is what was going on and this might be how you can find women. But there was a period of time where uh, an immigrant woman would automatically become a citizen when her husband became a citizen. And then eventually that wasn't true. And there were also cases where if a, during there was also a time period when if an American citizen, a woman married a foreign national, they would automatically lose their citizenship. So even if they stayed in the United States, they would be considered uh, a foreign national, even if they never left the US. So it can be really tricky. And I'm just explaining kind of the broad strokes. This is another, this is a good thing to look at just to try to get a little bit of a sense of what you might have to look at in order to find any records like naturalization records. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about some resources we have here at the BPL that can help that can help you find it. So we do have some books. So the you know there hasn't been a ton written about this, which so just we're just gonna uh, we're just gonna pick out uh, just a couple of things to look at. So one of the things I really thought that was cool is colonial American doctresses. So. 
you know, back before there was a medical school system and licensing, there was a lot of women did actually do a lot of healthcare work. Uh, practicing medicine, particularly in more rural places where the people didn't have access to any doctors such as they were known at the time. So this book will actually give you an idea of, like who these women were and actually look at it online too. It has been digitized. Okay, so I can see some stuff in the chat. Yes, I will be emailing everyone uh, my class slides. And also this is being recorded. So once the recording is available, I will send it out to everyone. Okay, so this one, you can check it out online. I can just look at a couple pages in preview here. So what this basically does, it'll give you some information about person, like for instance, uh, this person here, let me see if I in. So if you're lucky, you might even find a portrait. So if you're related to one of these women, you might be able to find a really good amount of information about them. So, okay, so I'm going to pop in another link to the handout. For those of you who missed it, who came in a little late. Another really great resource just in general are the Daughters of the American Revolution. So they have published a few things. Uh, again, uh, da, 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 there we go. So they've published a few books. This is just one of them. So this will give you, you know, a history of, and this is related to, as I said, I always recommend folks research the history of the time period they're looking at. So this is going to be a good resource for if you're researching someone during the revolutionary era. They'll tell you what women's lives were like and what information might be available about them. I can say that there are women who are recorded as ancestors in the Daughters of the American Revolution. It didn't start in the beginning, but one of the things they do now is if there's proof that a woman aided the revolutionary cause in some way, for instance, if they were one of those doctresses or if they provided livestock or supplies or something, the soldiers, and they would count as a patriot and you can claim descent through them. It's relatively recent as far as the DAR's history go, but that is something you can do if you don't have a man around that time. You can prove uh, was a patriot, but there was a woman that you might be able to do that through. That is an option. So I was pretty excited when I heard about that recently. But I do also have a book list that, uh, so you can see even more books we have that might help you research women here. And there's also, we have, uh, oh, I need to update that. So some of these books are going to be online. You can check them out on Hoopla. Hoopla is a really great resource the library subscribes to. You, There's no waiting list or anything. You can just check it out and read it right in your browser. It's uh, pretty cool. There's a lot of really, uh, there's a lot in this series here for tracing your ancestors. So it's not just uh, female ancestors. There's a bunch of different topics they go through. It's a pretty varied series. Okay, so we also have genealogy research guides. So we recently, uh, we used to have just one gigantic research guide, but we've uh, I've split it up into four, so it's a little bit more manageable. So the main one you would probably want to use uh, as well for this topic would be the special topics one. That's uh, where the section on researching female ancestors is. And you can know there's also a few other things we have in here. For instance, if you're researching adopted ancestors or if you want to know about DNA testing. But for now, we'll just look at this. So this will go into a little bit more depth than what I've been talking about. And there'll be even more links. You can also, if you're interested, watch a previous version of this talk I gave about two years ago. If you want to take a look at that. And, you know, more you know, links to everything we've discussed here. So that's just the basic one. But we also have, uh, whoops. Okay. Oh, right. Okay. <clears throat> so you can also take a look at the main one. So this is the big one. This is the one most people use, which is records and resources. So in here, we have information about how, you know, how to use various uh, types of records. So these are going to be the main records that folks use. So this will tell you how to access them, what they are, what kind of information you can find in them. We will also, for instance, in the case of the newspaper section, we will have links 
to resources the BPL has and resources other people have, uh, other places have. And again, if you interested, you can look at the class I taught on this topic last fall. So I have links to some of my old classes in here if you want to take a look at those. So again, the, so I was, you know, I, and I always like to promote newspapers. That's why I do so many classes on it because they are really underutilized outside of obituaries. And I'm trying to promote that. I've found just within the past couple of weeks, lots and lots of stuff about my ancestors and a lot of them were my female ancestors. So definitely take a look at this. There's a lot of really great information here and I try to keep it as current as possible. But if you do notice a broken link or anything, definitely a lot of snow and I will try to fix it. So there's a few other research guides that may be useful. Um, we're not gonna look at all of these, but most of the one we're gonna take a look at here is a list of residents. So this is one, as I said, uh, this is based on voter registration. So women will not be listed in it until 1921. So you can see here, these years listed on the left, those are the years that we have. There are some gaps, particularly early on. So that means we do not have them even in hard copy. We are using a 50 year gap between digitizing. Our government documents librarian is currently working on getting 1974 digitized. So this is being updated every year. So we're just gonna, so the other thing you need to know here, uh, it was not organized by address until 1985. So it wasn't organized alphabetically by last name until 1985. So prior to that, you will need to know where your person lived. And uh, so, yeah, so you would need to know that, but you also have some help here. They are organized, so before 1985, they're only organized by ward and precinct. And we have also digitized these street listings and that will tell you what ward and precinct they were in. So for instance, Brian, if we take a look at this one. Okay, it's being a little slow right now. There we go. So we're just gonna look randomly here. So these are organized alphabetically by street. You can see here, this will tell you uh, what parts of the street are in which ward and precinct. So you need to really pay attention to this. So for instance, if you see one like, see Medford Street here, it covers several different precincts within Ward 2. Some of the even longer streets will even cover multiple wards, like, from, like Commonwealth Avenue, Washington Street, they're gonna be in multiple wards. So you really need to know the, ne the number of the building you're looking at and look very carefully at where exactly it is. You will need to know these numbers here. So it's Ward and Precinct. Like, so once you do figure out what Ward and Precinct you're, they're in, then you can, come over here to the list of residents. So let's say we, let's just take a look at Ward 1. So we can see here, there we go. So these are organized, it'll be alphabetically by street name and then in numerical order by house number and then in alphabetical order by name. So again, as I was saying before, one of the reasons why this is a great resource is it will list where the person was the year before. So for most people, it's just going to be the same place. But for instance, for these folks here, they lived somewhere else the previous year. So you can kind of work yourself back, work backward there. You can also get some good information. Uh, so you can tell, it'll tell you their age. It'll tell you their occupation. And again, women, uh, they chose to note them with a dagger. I'm not quite sure why. Uh, there are also going to be some additions, usually right after uh, a war, that'll tell you whether or not they were a veteran. That's mostly right after World War One, World War II. Those notifications, those signs, you know, those little symbols will be in there. But this is also pretty cool because then you can see if they lived in an apartment building. So you can see here, for instance, uh, we in a bigger building. So these are all, like say. Uh, 74 Bennington, you can see there's a different family names there. So you can see that this was probably an apartment building or there was multi or multi-family dwelling. And sometimes if you can see like right here, there's a bunch of people with all the same last names. So this was a pretty big family. So this will kind of gives you the idea. You can see here, this is probably uh, parents who lived there with their adult children, or it could be 
uh, a grandparent and their children or a bunch of siblings. So you can kind of get an idea of what the building was like and who was living there. That's one of the that's one of the best resources. Uh, when women are listed again, they won't be listed until 1921, which is kind of unfortunate. But again, it can still be useful uh, to, once you get to the time period where women are in it. So let's see. And then we're also, so again, so yeah, we have time to look at this one. So the other thing I want to highlight here are some of the directories. So we were talking about those. We have a bunch that are digitized. We also have links to other to digitized versions that we did and that other folks did. So you get some information here about city directories. City directories, there is not a co, you know a complete collection of them anywhere. The best place to go, particularly for 19th century, would be to look at the Boston Athenaeum's website. They have digitized everything for every volume from 1789 to 1900. So if you're researching that time period, that's where you would want to go. So let's say, uh, yeah, let's try this one. See if I can get one of these to work. Ah, here we go. Okay, so let's look at 1873. There we go. So this is much, okay, so this is, uh, okay, there we go. So this is 1873. You can kind of get a sense here. So these would be listed alphabetically by name. It's just kind of zoom in here there we go actually so this is one of those exceptions so sometimes women would be listed so this person here emily molson she was a teacher so sometimes teachers would be listed under their own right you can see here it'll be listed their name and it'll tell you their occupation and sometimes if you're really lucky it'll tell you where they worked and where they live so this for this person right here they worked at 2 Bennett Street and they lived at 21 Sterling. Eventually, sometimes they'll just be abbreviated H at wherever. So this person, so this Emily Moulton, so how we would interpret this is that she was a teacher at the Mayhew School and she lived in Charlestown. For some reason, if they had to go beyond one line, sometimes they would go above instead of below. I'm not quite sure why they did that. It kind of screws up the transcriptions, makes it a little hard to read sometimes. That is how you would read that particular line. Okay, so you know, we just have a few other random things in here that just you might have women. Uh, I definitely would recommend taking a look at the newspaper research guide. If that is something you wanna look at, well, there'll be lots of information here about what newspapers we have and which format. Um, links to things online that you can search, what we have on microfilm, what we have in the databases, how to get to the databases. So this is a very useful uh, place to look at information for how you can get newspapers. We're just gonna look at, so the main thing I usually point out here, so this is our microfilm listing. So we're just gonna open this one. So this guide is just for the newspapers we have for Boston. That is, you can see it's 18 pages long and this is just Boston. That is the, a good part of our collection, but we do have newspapers from all over Massachusetts particularly, and then we do have some from other parts of the country. So definitely take a look at this guide, even if you're not looking from Massachusetts, and give you an idea of, where you, of what we do have. Okay, so we're not, again, we're not going to look at all of these. So these are just a few things. So we've talked about newspapers. You can, we can, if you do live in Massachusetts, you can get an e-card that will allow you to use our databases remotely. And that only uh, applies to you if you live, work. You can only get an e-card uh, for the databases if you live, work, go to school or own property in Massachusetts. I know we have a fair amount of you visiting from, you know, here from other states, but don't worry, there's uh, lots of lots and lots of libraries that have newspaper databases and a lot of them, um, particularly, you know, more so in the Northeast, uh, will have the boss, at least have the Boston Globe, or they might have this one here, which I really like called 19th century US newspapers that covers all over the country. So definitely check with your local library to see what databases they might have. 
these are the big ones we have that get used a lot. Uh, that would be like the Boston Globe database. This is part of ProQuest Historical Newspapers. These are the ones we subscribe to within ProQuest Historical Newspapers. Some libraries, if they're really fortunate, will have everything in here. We only have these four titles. We have the Globe, the Irish Times, the Jewish Advocate, and the New York Times. That's what we have. And they are listed separately on our website. So I'll just click on this one just so you can get an idea of what they look, what it looks like. All of these newspaper databases generally function the same way. I always recommend you go to the advanced search page. And if you know what time period you're looking at, limit your dates. Because you, if, for instance, if you put a name like John Smith, you'll get hundreds of thousands of results from time periods that you're not interested in. That's what I always recommend. Go to advanced search, restrict your dates. If you're looking at a database that has things from all over the country, restrict it to a place. That's what I would always recommend. Let's see. So real quick, I'm going to look at this one just so I can show you. There's something pretty cool about this one that I like, if it will load for me. There we go. So again, we're going to go into advanced search. So down here, um, let's say I just want, okay. What was I looking at there? Okay. So let's say I just want to limit it to, just curious here, what do they, they do not have my hometown in there. So we're going to go with Boston. Here we go. And so let's say the only name I can think of of a person who lived in Boston. So we're going to, at, in the 19th century, so we're going to look for Alexander Graham Bell. There you go. So why I really like this one. Sometimes what you get with newspapers, you have to kind of search through the whole thing to figure out if it's actually relevant. So what this one, why I like this one, it has keyword preview. So you can click on that little button and it'll show you where it found it on the page. So you, so you can figure out, is this actually relevant to me? And do I actually want to open this thing up and look at it? So that's why I really like this one. All right, so I see some folks already have some questions here. So I'm gonna try to get to as many of these as I can, but if you do have some questions, feel free to put them in the chat. So I'm gonna, let's see what we have here. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Okay, so Sarah posted a really cool link uh, to um, records for Ellis Island. I do have a link to that. Uh, my genealogy research guide, I do have a whole section on immigration and naturalization. So there is a link there and you are correct. The, the Massachusetts area National Archives are in Woburn. They do have records mostly, they're gonna be for New England. That's where the, basically the, Regional Archive is for New England. I think they might have no. They might have other states. I'm not sure. They call it the National Archives Boston, but they are in Woburn. They are not in Boston. Oh, or Waltham. No, you're right. Oh, Waltham. I'm sorry. I yeah. I just know they're not in Boston. Let me just double check here. You're correct, they are in Waltham. Waltham, I'm sorry, I misspoke. Yes, they are in Waltham. They call them Boston, but they are in Waltham. So again, uh, for those of you who came in late, this was recorded. I will be sending everyone a link to the recording. I will also be sending a copy of the handout and my slides so you, in the chat, so you don't have to worry if you missed something. Okay, so Phyllis is asking, do you need a BPL card to access your resources? Any out of town access? So. As I said, you do have to live in Massachusetts. If you live in Massachusetts, you can get to our online resources. You don't have to live in Boston, but you do need to either live, work, go to school, or own property in Massachusetts in order to access our online resources. And an e-card uh, will be good uh, for that. If you already have a physical card with the Boston Public Library, you do not have to get an e-card. If you have a physical card, 
That's all you need. You don't have to get an e-card. Okay, so Joyce is asking, do you have any suggestions about researching a woman who died in the late 1700s in childbirth? Hold on. <laughs> childbirth lived in rural New Jersey. I know her husband's name. It was a Quaker and left the local meeting after marrying her and on Quaker. That is in their records, but no information about her birth family. So that the late 1700s, that is a really hard time period. Uh, things were kind of spotty. Folks weren't really collecting records like this. The movement to collect and maintain records like this didn't really start until the later half of the 19th century. So I don't really know what's available in New Jersey. I would say uh, try contacting uh, a library or historical society out there and see uh, what recommendations they might have. Again, I'm more, I know about Massachusetts. I don't really know what they might have in New Jersey. So it sounds like you've already contacted the local friends uh, group that would have those records. So that would have been my other suggestion, but you've done that already. But yeah, I would say contact their local library uh, in the biggest town near there, or if there's a historical society, try reaching out to them. If there's a local museum, um, something like that, they might not have what you're looking for, but they will probably know where you need to go. Okay, so Maureen's asking, does the Athenaeum have records for towns and cities other than Boston? No, they don't. Uh, we do, though. So we have city directories for cities and towns all over the country. So it is primarily Massachusetts. However, we do have some for other places. It's going to be mostly the bigger cities. I think we have them for... Uh, New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, I think we have Los Angeles and Hartford. So we'd have, we definitely have stuff like that. I mean, depending on what records you're looking for, we might have something. I can tell you, we do have city directories. The Boston Athenaeum really just has Boston. And that's, I think, as far as I know, that's the only big collection that they've put up online. They are a private library that you do have to have a membership to, aside from, so you can't really access those things unless you're a member, uh, except for the directories they've put up. Okay. Okay, so Peggy's asking, I have, a, I believe you mean great, great grandmother born in 1822 of South Boston. What does that mean? So South Boston was a separate town. I'm not sure when it was annexed. So I'll, if you're not familiar with the geography of Boston, most uh, neighborhoods were originally separate towns and were annexed by Boston sometime in the 19th century, which South Boston was annexed in 1804. So, so it was not a separate place then. So you would be able to, just to find records for her just in the Boston record. South Boston wasn't separate at that point. So that just means she was born in South Boston. Um, uh, not being able to see the record you're looking at, I'm not sure what else that might mean, but it just means that that's the neighborhood she was born in. It is a neighborhood of Boston. So, okay. Uh, okay. Also, Rudy saying, you know, has a very good point. Uh, children's middle names can often can be a clue to a mother's maiden name. That is true. Sometimes their first names can be included to that too. There were some families where it was uh, practice to give the the mother's maiden name as a first name. That's why you sometimes get you know some funny looking names like for like Worthington or Smith or Sinjin because it was someone's la usually a mother's maiden name. So that can that is definitely true. Um, Barbara's asking, where can I find name changes in Worcester County? So that uh, depends on the time period. So let me get out of here. Um, let me see. So the state does have some resources. So it really would depend on when this and when it occurred, when the name was changed, what records might be available. So 
And it was before 1852, things got, it went through the general court. So there'll be a record in the acts of the general court as to what was going on, you know, as to what that was. So in that case, it would be with the state. It was after that time, it would be in the Worcester County Probate and Family Court, they would have that. So again, it depends on when the name change took place. It'll be in a different place. I accidentally closed the chat. Uh, there we go. Sorry, I lost my place here. Oh, there we go. Okay, so Chris is asking, any resources that list free Black women in the 1700s and early 1800s? Thank you. So again, that depends on where you're looking at. So there wouldn't be much in the way of records for the 1700s. Uh, the Boston Town Directory started, I believe, in 1790. But again, as I said, women aren't going to be listed in that. Uh, there was a separate section for colored people. So again, if you know if they were married or had a sibling, uh, um, a male relative they might have been with, you can try looking for them. So it's pretty much the same advice as I would give you for looking for a not looking for a white person. Um, pretty much the same advice. And again, but it does depend on where you're looking at. Like I said, my expertise is mostly about Boston and Massachusetts. If you're looking at another place, I always recommend contact the library there. Okay, so we covered that. Okay, so Sarah's asking, do BPL cards have expiration dates? Yes, they do. For physical cards, it's four years. For e-cards, it's two years. So if it's been, uh, if you had a physical card and it's longer than four years, you will need to renew it. And that you would need to do in person. You can also just get an e-card online and those are every two years. Okay, so I have a couple people recommending the New Jersey State Archives and State Library. That's also great. Like, if there isn't a library near the place where you're looking at, you can always try the State Library. I know the Connecticut State Library and the Maine State Library have pretty good genealogy departments that can help you if you're looking at those states. And I think that's probably true in most states, so, you know, depending on what they have. So Marianne's asking, do you have international databases? I am interested in Prince Edward Island and Scotland. Okay, so we do. So we do have a couple of let me see, uh, news, newspaper databases that do have coverage uh, of other countries. And we also subscribe to ancestor.com, which does have records from all over the world. But for newspapers, if we're looking at those, if I can get this to work for me. Apologize that this is kind of slow. Our internet is a little draggy sometimes. Newspapers. So if you go into our newspaper section, we can go down here. International. So uh, let's see. So this is mostly going to cover uh, the, the UK. So I don't know. They might still. There might be coverage of Scotland in the British collections here, but we scroll down here. This is one of our, okay, so we also have uh, this one. So this, this uh, so the International Herald Tribune. So that was, I believe that's a New York newspaper. So this covers their international edition. We do have that going back to 1887. And we have the Irish Times, as we mentioned, and we have the London Times. And the other one we have, one of the newer ones, is My Heritage Library Edition. I'm not going to go too deep into this, uh, but they do have lots of really good stuff. I will say the search function is a little wonky. So you just, uh, this one requires some patience uh, when you're trying to find stuff. But this also has a lot of other genealogy material in it. There's a bit of overlap with Ancestry.com, but they do have a really robust newspaper collection, and a lot of them are newspapers that were digitized from the BPL. And you can see in here, you can search things from mostly mostly European countries, but they also do have Australia in here. Okay, lots of great suggestions here. Okay, so Maureen's asking, are Boston politicians' family trees available through the BPL? I'm interested in a relative who is Honey Fitz's cousin. So that's not something we would have. 
the New England Historic Genealogical Society might have something like that. There, like whenever you hear of someone, uh, they do they do a genealogy for the president. Every whenever we get a new president, they do a genealogy. They'll sometimes do genealogies for famous people. So I would try the New England Historic Genealogical Society to see if they have something like that. You can definitely do that kind of research here, uh, particularly uh, for Honey Fitz. We would have a lot of material on that family. And for those of you who aren't familiar with that person, uh, this is uh, John F. Kennedy's maternal grandfather. He was a mayor of Boston. He was also in Congress for a little while. He was quite a character and it's a big family. Uh, so there's definitely going to be a lot of information about them. But as far as I'm aware, we haven't compiled a family tree. We don't really have the resources to do that. But the New England Historic Genealogical Society might have something. Okay, let me see. Okay, so let's see. So Sarah said, uh, I heard from an archivist at the LDS, so Latter-day Saints has an extensive database that can be helpful even if not Mormon. So yes, they do family search. Uh, so there's also there is a resource called Genealogy Bank. They a lot of these places, uh, we don't subscribe to Genealogy Bank or newspapers.com or fold three, but some of them will have free trials that you can look at. Uh, okay, so Heidi is uh, has a suggestion. Uh, someone asked about researching Black women in the 18th, 19th century. Try looking at the African American Female Intelligence Society of Boston and also the AME records. That's an excellent suggestion. Thank you, Heidi. Okay. So Joyce is saying, did I understand correctly that those of us out of state cannot access the Boston Library records? So you can't access our online resources. The so the databases that require a login know if you're out of state, you can't access those, but you, there's a lot of resources in the research guides that you can access. They're just free online resources. And you can always email us. Uh, we have our, let's see if I can get that up. You can always send us an email and we can try to, you know, we can try to help you out. We can't do a whole family trees. That's a bit beyond, our capability, but if you want to just verify something, we can definitely help you out with that. But also try your local library. Some of them are going to have some of the same databases that we do, depending on where you're located. They might also have some Boston newspapers, but your local library will also have some resources. But yeah, you do have to live in Massachusetts to get our online resources. So Pamela's asking, I'm looking for info on my grandmother in Savannah, Georgia. So again, I will contact the, the public library in Savannah to see what they might have. Like said, uh, my specialty is I'm thrilled that we get people from all over the country, but I am, do have more knowledge about Massachusetts. I'm not sure what's available in Savannah. So this is true generally, If you're even if you are in Boston or in Massachusetts, if you're researching someone Another place, always contact the closest library you can find there. Someone there will know where you can go. Uh, so Susan's asking, is there information on domestic Irish female workers who came here in the early 1900s? So they would be listed in the census. So if you have an idea of the family they were working for, you can try to find them that way. It is kind of hard to look them up because a lot of them were just listed as Bridget. For some reason back then, all Irish women were called Bridget, regardless of what their name was. They would just say, oh, that's Bridget. Not sure why they did that, but that's why it's a little tricky to find them. But again, that might be something that there is um, the Irish Ancestral Research Association or TIARA, that's the acronym. Uh, they might, they would be a good source of information. There's a lot of Irish genealogy websites. Again, if we, uh, going to keep plugging my research guide. I do have a section on researching Irish ancestry. <clears throat> so you can take a look in there. But again, for early 1900s, the census will be the only records that they will be listed in unless they got married or something like that, in which case they probably didn't, weren't working anymore. But let's see if I can pull this up here so I can send you a link. I love all the suggestions that everyone's putting in. That's wonderful. It's, this is a great little community we have here. I love it. Okay, so we're on to special topics here. 
you're searching a specific heritage. So I do have sections in here for African American research, French, Irish, Italian, and Native American. So this is a section for Irish. So there is some information here about looking for that. Yeah, take a look at that. Okay, also, yes, Irish genealogy, i.e. definitely, I do have a link to that in there. Okay. Okay, so Barbara's asking, my Massachusetts town charges a fee to New Hampshire residents. Did VPL do this, perhaps? So we do not have a system where people from out of state can pay a fee to access our online resources. That's just would be in violation of our vendor agreements, and we would risk losing access to our databases. So that's the main reason why we don't do that. I know other places do that. We do not. Uh, okay, so a plug here for the Berkshire Athenaeum. Yes, I used to work there. I am originally from Berkshire County, so I actually I used to work at the Berkshire Athenaeum. It is a great, they do have a really great local history collection. So definitely, if you have ancestors from the Berkshires, definitely try them out. Um, yes, definitely. So Doris is suggesting the Freedmen's Bureau. That's great. Yes, if you're looking for African-American families, they do have a lot of really good records in there. And actually, I do have some information about that in this section up here. Okay, so not seeing anything in there right now. So just see. Okay, so I do have a few more minutes. So if anyone has any last minute questions, feel free to plug, pop them in. <clears throat> uh, while we're waiting though, I can tell you. So we do have uh, our first guest speaker for the spring Local Family History Series is coming up on March 28th. We will have a guest speaker here from the National Archives talking about military records uh, covering from the Revolutionary War to World War I. So we're pretty excited about that. There'll be a link to more information uh, about that in your follow-up email that you'll be getting tomorrow. There we go. So that's our next uh, guest speaker coming up. We're I'm really looking forward to that. So if you're ever were curious about what you can get at the National Archives for that time period, definitely <clears throat> sign up for that and check it out. Our next genealogy class is, when is that? So that will be on April 18th. I'm just doing a basic intro class, uh, just talking about Basics of how to do genealogy research and going over more broadly uh, what we have for resources here at the BPL. So if you're new to doing re genealogy research or you're new to doing this type of research at the BPL, definitely uh, feel free to sign up for that. Okay. All right, so it looks like that's about it. So if anyone thinks of any questions that they thought that they and get a chance to put in afterwards, you can always email us at, at ask at bpl.org and give us a call Monday through Friday, nine to five. Uh, if no one answers, leave us a message with your name, number, and your question, and I guarantee someone will get back to you. It might take a day or two, but someone will get back to you. We do respond to all the phone calls we get. So just know that we sometimes have spotty coverage of the phone, so someone isn't always available to answer, but we will respond to you. We also have an online chat Monday through Friday, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. We're trying to promote that more. It doesn't get a lot of use, but I think it would be great. Uh, it is a pretty cool resource. Also, just a reminder again, for those of you who might have joined us a little late, this class was recorded. I'll be sending a link to it out to the recording out once it is ready. It'll be up on our YouTube channel hopefully within a few days. I will also be sending everyone a follow-up email tomorrow that will have a link to my slides as well as the handout and the chat transcript. And so if you missed anything, you'll be able to catch up there. So thank you everyone for coming to this first class of the spring. It's great to have such a robust crowd of people having a great conversation there. I hope you have a good evening and a good weekend.